In February of 2010, a webinar was presented on Learning in 3D by Carl Kopp and Tony O'Driscoll. Dan Blyton and Charles Gluck facilitated the webinar. In this excerpt of the presentation, Tony is discussing the seven sensibilities of 3D virtual worlds. Tony starts out his presentation with a story that is showing just how strong virtual worlds can be in touching lives. Uh, a colleague of mine created a dance hall because he's very much into uh, ballroom dancing. A, fr a frequent client of the ballroom said, I'd love to rent this place for me and my wife just for the two of us. Could we rent it? He brings his wife along. They, they dance for about an hour. They slow dance to Lady in Red. And the next morning, my friend gets a note from the wife saying, thank you so much. The last time I actually physically was able to dance to that song with my husband was 20 years ago because she'd been in a car accident. So what do we do? Uh, what Carl and I decided to do was to try and write a book that spanned the whole gamut of what's going on in learning in 3D. But at the core, when you get into the back, you know, after, after all of our examples, we've, we've developed what we believe is a comprehensive 3D learning architecture. And underlying all of this is something I'm about to talk about, which are the seven sensibilities, which are those things that make the 3D environment fundamentally different than any other environment we've had before. So let me let me hit these really quickly, and then and then we'll move into some some more of the design principles. But we started to look at this technology and tried to determine what makes it different. And one of the first things that does make it different, as Carl said, is this notion of the sense of self. But the sense of self is essentially um, the idea that in the first incarnation of the web, when we were just writing to each other, we could have the smiley face. In the second incarnation, where where we we're where we we're on AOL, we could maybe use emoticons. Clearly, over time, we've been moving and moving and moving forward into much better virtual representations of ourselves, uh, known as avatars. And obviously, I saw a question there, how much does avatar creation, uh, the notion of avatar creation, and clearly the movie Avatar coming out has a little bit of a different sensibility, but more basic concept of this is essentially my digital sock cup puppet. So on my left here is Tony O'Driscoll, and on the right is my alter ego in Second Life, What a Trip. And here we have Carl Kopp with his alter ego, Abbott Bundy. And the, but the idea here is that you develop a kinship and a sense of self through to and through your avatar. When you're operating in a uh, virtual environment, your, your cursor becomes like a 3D cursor, and how you interact and, and how you, how you demonstrate your poise and so on and so forth, you, you, you actually attract reputational capital around your avatar. So a lot of people then are interested in maybe looking a little bit more buff in the, in the environment. I know I certainly look a little, I mean, I probably look about 10 years younger and I probably look uh, like I did when I was lifting weights and playing soccer in college type thing more so than I do today because uh, people spend a lot of time playing around with their avatar. Okay, second one is death of distance. My shorthand on here on this one is uh, there's there's two 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 kind of phrases that I think are useful or resonant. The first one is that geography is history in virtual worlds, and what I mean by that is right now as we're sitting here in this environment, everybody who I'm looking at at the on the left window pane under chat with all those names, they're all sitting in their respective places, looking at Flatland application, somewhat removed from this discussion, maybe reading email paying either, you know, pay, paying a level, I don't know how much attention, right? However, in the virtual world, the guy in the red shirt and the guy in the blue shirt there are actually in a third place in cyberspace where they're both interacting and they have to pay attention to each other. So it's not just death of distance, meaning we're electronically connected. It's also death of distance, meaning that there's a third place in cyberspace that's created and there's kind of a social set of mores that come with that to where your digital sock puppet has to act accordingly. And I think we think that that's a pretty powerful thing. The power of presence is we're all co-present at this point in time. We may be in different time zones and so on and so forth. But when you're doing it in a third in, in, in a third place in cyberspace like this around the table, right? Or when you are in a conference room or when you are zoned out like Abbott is right here, you, you get that visual cue when you're in the third place in cyberspace. And, and the fact that I know Abbott is not present here, when we were writing up the Flatland application, right at this part of the story, uh, somebody's boss, it was, I don't know if it was Abbott's boss, but just for illustrative purposes, Al, Abbott's boss has called him out of the third place in cyberspace to deal with something back in the real world. 
And all of his colleagues were mad at Abbott because, Abbott, you need to be here. We're working on something right now. We're trying to win this game. And you disengaged from the, from the third place in cyberspace. You weren't present with us because you had to go off and do something for your boss. We're mad at you, which is kind of completely the flip of what we tend to think of when we talk about uh, connecting at a distance. So we think the sense of self, meaning I, I'm, I'm instantiated into an avatar, right? The power of presence, meaning that avatar is in a third place in cyberspace that is where there are other avatars. And the third part then, which is, and my presence there is almost expected and required, those three come together to create a pretty solid basis upon which to create some, some useful, uh, engaging learning experiences. Okay, the next one is the sense of space. The sense of space is useful in that it, um, here everybody's anthropomorphized, if you will, to the humanoid form, and they're sitting in a meeting, which is something we're quite used to, right? And we can we can say, okay, that's great. We can create other spaces where we set up a doctor's uh, meeting, and, and we can go sit on the bench, and the doctor, we can do a, 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 an evaluation of the doctor's bedside manner. But we also have to think about the fact, and this is a picture Carl took of me, of we don't have to be anthropomorphized to humanoid form, or, or we don't have to be that to that scale. Here I am in my humanoid form, but I'm sitting on a protein molecule. So now we can start to play with space and scale in new and different ways to where we can either be, you know, an orrery or a planet orbiting, the, we can go sit on the dark side of the moon, or we can get down to being a white blood cell moving through the vascular system. And, and, and in areas where that kind of experience are important from a learning and instructional perspective, we, we, we see that that's very, very useful and something that's probably really hard to do in the real world. The next one is co-creation. This is a this is really key. Is the is it's kind of like Wikipedia, where everybody gets together and you leverage the wisdom of the crowd to co-create something. But this is like Wikitecture. It's the opportunity for multiple people to get together and co-create. And in setting up a co-creative activity, you're driving this opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer learning, where people contribute what they know, and they're all contributing to a greater whole. The next one is pervasiveness of practice. And, you know, a lot of times when we set up these type of environments, one of the things we do is drill, drill, repeat, drill, repeat. Certainly in the military in the one, in, and, and in medical, the ones I've observed, it's kind of a drill, repeat. So once you've set up an environment, uh, it's not unlike simulations. You have the opportunity to drill and repeat, drill and repeat, and you can gather data to see whether there's improvement over time. The other cool thing then is that you, and this kind of goes to the next one, the enrichment of experience, then you could flip roles. So now, you know, the next person comes in, that you change roles, and you, you start to see it from the other person's perspective, not the third person view, but you're actually playing a different role and practicing it out. So we believe that as you take these seven, six sensibilities, put them together, you can create an environment that enriches the experience for the learner and perhaps even does so in a shorter amount of time. You know, if, you, if you're familiar with the Second Life environment, not many of us that I know can actually physically fly, but in that, in that environment you can. So take those all together as the foundation. Then what we said is, okay, if, if those are the things you can do, right, the, how do they load onto the macrostructures, and then how do we bring that up the next level, which Carl's going to talk about in terms of building out learning archetypes that take advantage of these sensibilities, that differentiate them from flat land, that we could snap together into a meaningful learning experience. This book is a must-have for any instructional designer seeking to integrate virtual worlds into their training.